Ever get hungry and want a snack? But when you, you start looking in the cabinets, the fridge, your neighbor's pantry, nothing, uh, nothing fulfills your craving, right? I guess I should dismiss the kids, huh? They're, they're the ones that are responding the most. Kiddos, go have fun. You don't want to hear me anymore. That was the best part of the sermon anyways. It's all downhill from there. I told you, amateur night. So we're hungry. We're looking for a snack. Got it? All right. But you start nibbling on things and you're never satisfied. You know, it's just you're not hungry anymore, but you're not satisfied. Maybe you needed a full meal instead. That's how I equate studying God's word. We're inherently hungry for it. We're hungry for God's guidance. A little nibble here and there, daily devotionals. That's good. That's good. Staves off the hunger. But there's much more that's available to nourish us. Full meals when we study entire passages, chapters, books. Scripture as it is intended proves and explains itself. And it won't leave us hungry. So this morning, as we go through our scripture piece by piece, let's pay attention to how it introduces concepts and builds uh, blocks to complete its message. Every verse has a purpose, not only in it and of itself, but also in support of other verses in the Bible. It's pretty awesome when you look at it. This morning, we're going to study most of 1 Peter, 1, uh, 1 Peter 5. Uh, I think it's incredibly relevant, especially in the days in which we're living. The world is a scary place. We sit in our social bubbles, reading our favorite trustworthy news sources, listening to our favorite podcasts, maybe. And we tend to believe that we're living in the worst times ever experienced on planet Earth. Now, first of all, I can neither confirm nor deny that, for I've only ever lived now, so I can't really compare. But we can look to history. We can see patterns, and there's always a couple of constants when we face trouble. First constant, ourselves. Always a constant. Ever try to get away from yourself? I, uh, I once ate so many tacos that I had an out-of-body experience, but I, I don't think that's the same thing. Susie knows. The second constant, the enemy. We know from scripture that the enemy, Satan, he seeks to undermine God and his plan. And if you're walking in alignment with God, you can trust that the world will reflexively recoil against you. Thanks to the influence of the enemy. What can you do? Glad you asked. I heard you asked, Tony. What we can do is see what scripture says to us about how we are to behave and how we are to address ourselves and the enemy in amidst these trials. And that's what today's message is titled, Addressing Self and the Enemy. Let's uh, let's stand and read from our scripture this morning. If you'll flip to 1 Peter 5, we're going to read 1 through 11. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 11. I'm reading from the New King James Version, unless otherwise uh, noted this morning. 1 Peter 5. The elders... Who are among you, I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, 
walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So please be seated. Let's pray. God, we are enthralled by what you have for us. Lord, we, we look to you for guidance. We look to you knowing that we are incapable of navigating everything that the world throws at us. And we look to you because we know you are in control. So bless this morning, God. I pray that you would speak to us directly uh, as a body and that we would take the lessons given in our lives, God. So we praise you this morning. It's all for you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to break down this section of scripture, and I'm going to share where my brain goes with this information. So hold on for a bumpy ride. And remember, scripture proves itself. It completes its own thoughts and ideas. Remember that. First, I want to say that the purpose of Peter's epistle was in three parts, generally. One, to explain the doctrines of Christianity to newly converted Jews in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I practiced those. Thank you. Two, to prompt holy conversation and the faithful discharge of duties to secure peace and shore uh, the body up against the slanders of the enemy. And three, to prepare the church for suffering. Those three things. So as we go with point number one this morning, we're going to talk about addressing ourself. And when I say addressing self, I do mean it in the context of how we address each other and ourselves within the church. Verses one through four, Peter is speaking to the elders or leaders in the church and newly converted Jews. In addressing the elders, Peter relates himself as a fellow elder. I who am a fellow elder. An interesting point, considering the importance placed on Peter as being St. Peter, the first pope who had power and preeminence over the early church. But in Peter's own words here, he claims to be their equal, the equal of the other elders. We see from this passage that Peter did not consider himself more than anyone else, and that's a point we should not quickly gloss over. Too often we see churches these days led by a single person who claims to be the head of the church, that God speaks to them alone. I don't believe this to be the model Christ laid out for us. I could be wrong, but I see Christ as the head of all churches. And even Christ gave glory to God the Father during his entire earthly ministry. That illustrated God the Father's ownership of that ministry. So any human who claims to be the prophet of their church, in essence, taking the attention off of Jesus and putting it onto them, should be regarded with large-scale skepticism, I would say. We, God's servants, should become less and he should become more, right? John 3.30. So today, some are put in the positions to teach in the church, to administrate to lead certain aspects of the church, but does that make those people greater than others? I can tell you in all certainty, it does not. Because as I stand before you this morning, blessedly burdened with the task of studying scripture with you, I stand before you as an equal. Even though I stand as a teacher, which some would argue is a proof of God's sense of humor. Uh, My prayers are no more powerful than your prayers. Remember, God seeks personal relationships, you and him, not you, a pastor and him, not you, a priest and him, not you, a statue or a ritual and him. Get my point? So while I'm more than happy to pray for you, you don't need me to pray for you. And if you ask me to, of course I will, but with no more power than what comes from your own heart in your own prayers. 
Your relationship with God doesn't require a third wheel. And that's not to take anything away from unified corporate prayer. That is still a wonderful practice to be unified and aligned. But Peter here, addressing himself as their equal, puts everything into context and is a model for how we are to address ourselves and behave with each other. Peter lets his readers know that, hey, we're in this together, but here's what I see from my experience of walking with Christ. This is perhaps the main distinction between him and those who he is exhorting, that he was a witness to Christ, his sufferings and his glory. As he stated in verse 1, a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So there is wisdom in his words that others should heed based on his experience. Doesn't make him better, just makes his experience something to note. And in that wisdom, Peter exhorts the people, the readers, to do certain things. You can see on the Megatrons, shepherd eagerly and honestly. Be an example. Submit to each other. Be humble. Cast your cares upon God. Let's start with shepherd eagerly and honestly, which is in verse 2 there. You ever work with somebody who just doesn't care about the work? We can sniff those people out, right? Pretty easy. Not to mention that person's work product suffers, as well as the morale surrounding them. Peter warns shepherds or pastors from just going through the motions. That's true for all Christians. You know, just showing up on Sunday for your weekly control-alt-delete reset isn't being eager in the faith, is it? And true, there's nothing required more than wholehearted and true faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. However, how will our testimony be in the world, at work, at home, if we're just lukewarm in our actions? Remember what James said about works. In James 2, 14 through 18, God's word says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, we know we can't be saved by our works, right? But our works are evidence of our faith. No lukewarm people here. This leads, of course, into being an example to the flock in verse 3. Serving or, or for a pastor, shepherding eagerly and honestly will be a great example to everyone around you. Pastor Austin touched on this last week, if you were here. How being an example is happening whether you want it to or not. Our choice is, do we want to be a good example or a bad example? Peter also warns the reader to not lord, little l, lord, over people who are entrusted to you. I believe we already addressed this equal footing that uh, Peter puts himself on with others. And he reminds the reader that earthly recognition is finite. So we are to shepherd and serve eagerly, be an example for the sake of eternal recognition. Peter says, so that we can receive the crown of glory from the chief shepherd or Jesus Christ, as he says in verse four. This again references Jesus as the head of the church, not a man, not Peter, right? Jesus. The text alludes to the idea that those who do their duty will gain more than anything finite in this world. They will receive a crown of glory an eternal reward. Now, crowns of reward are mentioned several other times in Scripture, not just here. 2 Timothy, James, uh, Revelation 2.10. We don't really know what that's going to look like, but our meager human understanding, and for that, the analogy of a crown is used to signify some sort of heavenly recognition. Submit to each other. It's a good one. In verse 5, Peter establishes a hierarchy for his readers that the young should submit to the elders. 
This makes sense in that those who are elders tend to have more experience and wisdom than the young, a point discussed earlier regarding Peter's experience walking with Christ, right? Similar points are made in Scripture as the fifth commandment in Exodus 20.12, honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord and your God is giving you. That's echoed again in Matthew 15.4 and Ephesians 6.1. Proverbs 1.8 says, My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother. And then in Colossians 3.20, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And since there are some kids here in the audience, I'm going to read that one again. Children, obey your parents, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Again, this doesn't place anyone as greater in a church sense, okay? But some, in this case, elders, should be regarded as a source of wisdom. Now, I recognize that's a blanket statement because there's some of us who might be long in the tooth where their wisdom or advice might not be worth taking or heeding. We have to take that on a case-by-case basis. But Peter brings us all back, this idea of submitting. He brings it all back to the idea that Everyone should submit to each other. So submit to your elders, submit to each other. What's he talking about? He says, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now this reiterates the idea that the church, everyone in the church is on equal footing. Submit to each other as needed. Recognizing that others may have wisdom worth submitting to and be humble enough to do so because God resists the proud. Peter here is empowering and preparing his readers for a purpose, as we'll see in verses 8 and 9. Peter says to be humble in verse 6. Not just humble, but humbled under the mighty hand of God. Who wouldn't be humbled under the mighty hand of God. Quick answer, the enemy, those under his influence, the lost, at least that's what they think, because eventually everyone and everything will be humbled in God's presence or undone, as it says in Isaiah 6, 5, woe is me for I am undone. Peter reminds his readers to cast all cares upon God because he cares for them. A notion also mentioned in Philippians 4, 6, one of my favorite verses. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So Peter has taken this time to support and shore up his readers Show them how to be united, how to be humble, how to be aligned. But why? Just for the good of the order? No. Peter elaborates as to the why next in point number two. Addressing the enemy. I'm going to read verses eight and nine again from this morning's text. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Look at that description of the enemy. Walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The uh, NIV version says he prowls around. Peter's taken the time to exhort in verses 1 through 7 on how to treat each other, how church leaders can shore up the body. Was this an arbitrary exercise? I don't think so. He did this because he knew very well there's an active enemy seeking our destruction. Peter first addressed the work we need to do on ourselves so that when needed, we can present a united front against the enemy. Peter describes the enemy as an adversary. An adversary isn't someone who's passive in their contention for us, but rather proactive in pursuing against us to devour us or destroy us. 
So with that in mind, how prepared are we? What is our response to this knowledge that we're being hunted by the enemy? There's a few ideas about that. But remember, the enemy is ever active and it's worthwhile to be of the same mindset, ever active in our faith. This brings a question to my mind. Are we being ever active in our faith? We going out and sharing God's word? Should evangelism be done only in mega church crusades? Or by televangelists with huge, bright, white, chiclet teeth and really good hair? Definitely not. Definitely not. Good news is lately we have been seeing some pretty cool large-scale prayer events with souls being saved. That's awesome and very refreshing. Because check this out. The enemy evangelizes all around us for his purpose. The forces of evil tirelessly toil for the devil while most of us blissfully stumble through our lives, dabbling in church, reading the Bible every now and then, bashfully withholding the miraculous work Christ has done for us because we don't want to turn somebody off. We don't want to turn them away. Do you think the enemy is bashful? Indeed not. He's shameless in his efforts. He, the enemy, has recruited all the powers of the world, be them politics, entertainment, media, or educational institutions, Facebook debates. Ever read those? Don't do it. He, the enemy, has tirelessly over the ages toiled to destroy the name of Christ, toiled to make Christians feel ashamed to profess their faith, embarrassed to share the gospel for fear of being branded a crazy person, one of those Jesus freaks. Well, I'm happy to break it to you that we aren't to be ashamed. How do I know that? We're told not to. Romans 1, 16 through 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Again, in Romans 10, 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For those of us who fear the shame, fear sharing Jesus with others, consider the words of Christ himself and be encouraged in the face of scrutiny, so long as it is scrutiny for his sake. In Mark 8, 35 through 38, Christ said, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The same idea is echoed in Luke 9, 23 through 26. But Jesus then continues in Matthew 10 to encourage those who would share his good news and also addressed those who would deny him. Matthew 10, 32 through 33. Christ says again, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. It's pretty clear. It's pretty clear. Remember, evangelism, scary, I get it. And it's not without challenge. But we do it out of love, right? We don't want to see anybody lost, even our enemies. When you really think about it, nobody, we don't want to see anybody in hell. We do it out of love. And as Patricia May Geraldo said, known to most as Pat Benatar, love is a battlefield. 
And on battlefields, we know the enemy is trying to hit you with their best shot. They sometimes come at us in the heat of the night. But remember, remember, we belong to the light. For those of you who missed it, uh, there were like four Pat Benatar songs I mixed in there. 80s fans unite. You'll be singing that all day. We belong to the light. No, okay. No more of that. Jokes aside. Evangelism is a battlefield, and we have to present a united front. Evangelism isn't going to win every soul and every heart. There is an inherent conflict in evangelism. It's not all puppies and rainbows. For the gospel will divide, as Jesus himself acknowledged in Matthew 10, 34 through 39. He says in 34, Do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. But what's the alternative? I hate to break it to you. We're already on the battlefield. Can we simply hide on an active battlefield? Well, not for long and not effectively. The enemy is stalking us, remember? He seeks whom he may devour. He wants us to hide and stay stagnant. Easy prey. But the Bible has laid out some important guidelines for us. Which brings me to point number three. Unfortunately, my final point. <laughs> point three, what's a person to do? It might seem smothering and insurmountable to know that we're being actively hunted by an enemy. But that's where we're at. No use hiding or trying to ignore it. The best course is to follow what scripture provides for us, to use that as our lantern in the darkness. And Peter didn't just leave his readers hanging. He left a bit of advice for us on how to deal with this stalking enemy. So what's his advice? Be sober. Be vigilant. Resist. Steadfast in the faith. No. Be sober or self-controlled. What does that mean? This cuts right to our base human sinful tendencies. Peter, being human, understood the first steps to being in control of a situation is being in control of yourself. Susie and I often tell our kids, you can't control others. The only thing you can control is yourself, your actions, and your reactions. As far as our understanding of what sober is these days, it would stand to reason that if one isn't sober, they are not fully in control of themselves as they are under some other influence. And Pastor Pat actually touched on that a couple weeks ago, uh, so I won't go into that again. But Peter's exhortation about this stands up against other verses in Scripture, the Bible proving the Bible, right? 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, in relation to to the watching for the second coming of Christ. Therefore, let us not sleep and as others do, but let us watch and be sober. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a, of power, of love, and of sound mind. Proverbs 25.28, Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. All talking about being in control, right? Soberly in control. You want to have broken walls and insufficient protection when the enemy comes knocking? Probably not, right? Then we are to remain in a state of self-control. What about vigilance? Be vigilant or watchful is another way of saying that. Vigilance isn't a passive term. It doesn't say, be vaguely aware of. No, this is a call against complacency, against passivity. Be fully aware of what the enemy is doing. For instance, we understand that the good news of Christ is a loving message. 
and shared with the hope that souls will be saved from eternal separation from God, what we call hell. However, our Christian agenda or mission has been overshadowed by popular new ideas of societal norms that are based in sinful behavior. Right? Be aware of this stuff. I know you are. I could list many popular ideas that the world has offered that have not turned out so well over time. I don't know why everybody's so excited about these new ideas all the time. Cocaine gum. That was a good one. Cigarettes. Those used to be those used to be uh, advertised to to mothers in the in the magazines. Leeching, where they would use leeches to suck out your illness. Bell bottoms. Betamax. Pomeranians. The color periwinkle. Jaws, two, three, and four. All things that didn't work out so well. Our agenda, Christ's agenda, has been perverted to be seen as crazy by the world. The enemy actively seeks to make those who wish to share the gospel feel a false sense of embarrassment or shame. That's the enemy's doing. We just read about that. Are you actively watching? Being purposefully vigilant against this? Because this is where we find ourselves these days. The enemy is seductive and persuasive in the world. But God doesn't leave us without a fallback plan. Resist. Another active verb, not a passive one. Resistance is an action, not the absence of one. Resisting doesn't mean hiding in our homes because we choose not to partake in the world's nonsense. I got to fight that urge personally. I'll tell you right now. Don't want to deal with it. Stay in my safe zone. But that's not what we're called to do. Ever play tug of war? Can you resist the other team by not doing anything? No, you'd end up flat on your face in an inflatable swimming pool full of mayonnaise and chili powder. You don't play it like that? (laughs) My point is, and I have one, I promise. In order to resist, we must do something. And can we resist in our own power? Maybe to a certain extent. I was always raised and sold on the idea of willpower. Willpower. I think it's a great and noble notion. But it's limited. What's it limited by? Us. No show of hands, but anyone here ever been on a diet? How does that diet work when you come up to the holidays? How's that willpower holding up when your buddy or your spouse bakes a fresh batch of rookies for the Christmas party? Rookies, you know what that is, right? Brownie and cookie, all in one. Oh, the only thing that would make that better is you put some cheesecake in there. What would you call that? Brookie's cake? Thank you. Not going to work. That willpower suffers. We, we fold under our own power. We have to recognize that. And that when we resist, there is also this notion in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are capable or able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God is good. God is gracious. We're not to rely just on ourselves. In Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We're not doing it alone. We're not. Don't trick yourself into thinking you can do it alone. God gives us the strength to resist so we don't have to do it all in our own power. He's not going to leave us hanging. So, we have an enemy. He wants to devour us. 
We're going to hide our light under a pillow so he doesn't find us? Should we give in to the fear of ridicule for sharing our faith? Rather, why don't we revel in the elation? Remember that feeling when you were saved? It was elation, pure elation. Why don't we revel in that? That's what comes with that knowledge of salvation. Why don't more of us get excited about our eternal salvation? Why don't we want to share it more? Why don't we resist by countering the evil message of the world and the enemy with the good news of salvation through Christ? Because Peter didn't just tell us to resist, but to do so while being steadfast or resolute in the faith. And come on, if we're resolute in the faith, then we should be compelled to share it, knowing full well what it is and what it does. Most churches today are content with inward teaching. We gather on Sundays during midweek studies. We study together. We pray together. Then we go home. I wonder how many of us desire to win souls for Christ. How many of us consider resisting the enemy steadfast in our faith on the battlefield where he thrives? Lastly, we are to know, to know. Peter tells us to know that other believers in the world experience suffering like us. Did he just say misery loves company? I could have done that. No, he's, he's got a purpose, remember, in his writing of this letter. To explain the doctrines of Christianity, to, pr to prompt holy conversation, and to prepare the church for suffering. Peter brings it home with the promise of Jesus. Everyone experiences suffering. And again, last week, Pastor Austin was talking about this. It's not a question of if we'll suffer. It's when, how much, how long, and how we deal with it. Peter focuses on Christ as he closes this letter in verse 10. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Peter reveals that suffering has a purpose. You ever try to deliver that message to someone in the midst of their suffering? Not an easy one and not always received well. And that's why I think Peter is preparing his readers now, hopefully before they experience their next great suffering so that they may rely on those words that, and God's promises when it happens. They'll be prepared. We can surmise from this passage that our suffering has purpose. We saw it with Joseph, Job, and David in the Old Testament. And we saw it with John the Baptist, Paul, and Jesus himself. God does not let us suffer for the sake of suffering. He will use it for his purpose to perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle us. On this, we can be settled. Peter's epistle here, it's interesting because Peter is sometimes thought of as a rogue and impulsive person. And while at times his actions as portrayed in the gospels at least, painted him as over eager, sometimes careless, at the time of this epistle, he is obviously presenting himself as a thoughtful and sober-minded person. Much maturity has taken place from when we first met Peter in Matthew 4.18. That should give us all hope for ourselves. <laughs> and remember, now, in this epistle, he has the Holy Spirit with him. And so do you. So to close... Our thoughtful and sober-minded Peter reminds us that we are in this fight together and that we have a battle plan. He does this by putting us all on the same footing, reminding us we need to be able to submit to each other as needed, be humble, and cast our cares upon God. Peter doesn't hesitate to identify our enemy as the devil and describe his intention for us. I think we fail there a lot. We don't want to even mention the enemy. 
but he's real. Peter doesn't tell us to put our heads in the sand, but rather to be sober, vigilant, to resist and to know. We're better equipped to resist the enemy when we're solid in our understanding of his methods and we are confident in God's plan for us. We also shore up our defenses by sharing the good news, sharing the gospel, bring others into the trenches with us, actively resist. How cruel, some people might say. Why are you recruiting others to be in the trenches with you, to be in this fight? Why? Because we read the end of the book. Our side wins. We're recruiting people to the winning team. And that did deserve an amen, didn't it? Thank you. So let's not put our heads in the sand while the enemy stalks around us, devouring whom he might. Let's shine the light of Christ in our individual lives. Spread the good news and confound the steps of the enemy. In Peter's words, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, oh God, I pray that we would take your word as more than just mere advice, but God, as instruction, as exhortation, as it is meant to be. God, that you would help us to lean on your assurances that we would never be ashamed of who you are and what you've done and what you will do, that we would never submit to the power of the enemy that we would never hide your light in this world. God, I pray that you would strengthen this church, that you would help us to spread your gospel, your good message, and that the people around us would be better for it, that souls would be saved, and that we would recruit others on the winning side of this battle. God, you are amazing. You are the only one who can do this. Father, we commit this to you in the holy name of your son, Jesus. Amen.